under the Shah, there'd been a surprising degree of, of modernization, modernity sort of emerging. You know, universities springing up, you had a manufacturing sector, it was looking more and more Western. Was it corruption? Was it uh, uh, religious factors? What halted that with, uh, and led to the downfall of the Shah? Well, there's a lot of different things that you think about because it's easy. That anytime you talk to people uh, in regards to Iran, they'll bring up Savak with the Shah. Well, the Shah was a ruler. He was tough. He was this, he was that. And you know Mossadegh and you know what the CIA did to not allow Mossadegh to run Iran because Mossadegh would have done a great job and Iran would have been this and Iran would have been that. Mossadegh was a modern day Bernie Sanders is who he would have been. So Iran would have been a socialistic nation. So when the Shah came in, you know, women didn't have any say. They didn't have any say. Now they could be lawyers. Now they can vote. Now the age to get married, I think, went from 13 to 15 years old to, I mean, you know, you may say 15 years old. That, that's a big difference. Eight, 13, 15. And women were a little bit more freer. You know, they had a voice. They had independence. They could go around and vote. You couldn't do that before. And, uh, Elizabeth Taylor was dating the ambassador, U.S. ambassador working in Iran, Zahedi. They were dating each other. Frank Sinatra would come to Iran. Concerts were amazing. Nightlife was amazing. A lot of times the, the wealthy of the wealthy around the world, you know, they would go to Iran. If you had yeah, money, you'd go right. to Iran. You know, that's where you would go for vacation yeah. because that's where... The rich people would go to, and then and that I, and that that Persian culture that went back for absolutely. centuries. Absolutely, so rich. I mean, if you want to go see a nice museum, you we go here. This building has been here for 150 years. I'm like 150 years. This building has been here for 2,000 years in Iran. You go to certain places, the history is completely different. But so you ask why? What happened for it to flip? Now, you know, if, if some will say. An agreement came about in 1954, it was an oil agreement that the Shah and Iran, not, you know, the Iran signed that was coming up. So 1954 was a 25 year agreement that was coming up in 1979. And France was involved, US was involved. I want to say Germany was involved and UK was involved. I think these were the four countries. And they had a meeting in South or Central America. There was a meeting where they said, we have to figure out a way what we need to do because if this thing renews, he's going to raise the prices on all of us, and this is going to be tough. We have to figure out a way for this not to happen. Some call it a conspiracy. Some have all this documented that this meeting took place. There's plenty of documentaries to watch on this thing. And then they said, if this is going to be taking place, we got to figure something out. So who was the enemy to pin against the Shah? A guy who was in exile from Iran for a little over a decade, Khomeini, who was living in France, Paris at the time, and he was sending tapes into Iran to get the message to be viral. Carter comes yeah. in. And he um, was deeply convicted that the West was corrupt and degenerate. 100%. Yeah. 100%. So he's living in Paris. That's right. He's learning in Paris. He's saying the West is just disgusting. Yeah. Really virulently anti-West. And he was calling Shah the puppet to the West. You know, that yeah. was the biggest thing. Yeah. The puppet to the West. The puppet to the West. Anyway, so eventually these tapes come in. People start listening to it. And the Shah's kind of worried because... He had the two-day party. The two-day party was like the Communist Party that's what, that was coming down from Russia, and they were coming and living in Iran, and they were spreading the Communist Manifesto. He was very worried about that. So a big part of uh, Savak's job was to make sure he always prevented two-day party for creating momentum, but he didn't think Khomeini was ever going to have the momentum. He thought it's not going to be a big deal. Anyways, Carter comes December 31st of 1977. He does a toast with the Shah, and you can see this video, and he says, you know, Iran and the Shah is a very important partner of the U.S. And they do a toast, Carter leaves. Literally, when Carter leaves, revolution begins. Once the revolution begins, there was a massive uproar when a fire took place at a theater called Cinema Rex Fire in Abadan. Abadan is the main area with all the oil refineries. When that Cinema Rex Fire happened, the, the two-day party, as well as Khomeini's party, they went around saying it was Savak because... They locked in the theater. 400 people are there watching a movie. They locked the doors. They turned the place on fire. Nobody could leave. 400 people died. They blamed Savak. The moment they blamed Savak, they blamed the Shah. At that point, 9 million people revolted. And when the Shah asked for help from Carter and Kissinger, they didn't help him out. And next thing you know, he had to leave. And the rest is history. Very profound for the world we now live in, that whole event. So 
the, the West lost a friend, maybe not a very good friend in some ways, but they lost a friend. So the clerics gain control and Khomeini for a while is torn about whether to allow some sort of democracy or elected leadership, as I understand it, or whether to make it an out and out theocracy and the latter wins. Is that right? Is that sort of what happened? In regards to him, um, well, he, he's not a politician, right? Yep. Uh, Ruallah Khomeini, he's more an imam. Yep. He's more a religious yep. figure. It's not somebody that's going to be able to, you know, uh, uh, make decisions on how to, what is the right way to run a nation. Other people were doing that for him. But, uh, you know, look, I mean, uh, in, in many ways, when Iran had Shah there, Nobody in that region was worried. There wasn't issues with uh, all the other countries. Israel was fine. You know, people weren't really going to, of course, Israel came on later on, but Israel had its own deal. It wasn't as scary as it is today. Today, when you say Middle East, the average person doesn't say, I'd love to go to vacation to the Middle East. Person doesn't wake up and say, honey, let's take our kids to the Middle East. Maybe you go to Dubai. Maybe you go to Qatar for the World Cup, but you're not waking up saying, let's go to Iran anymore. So. Him being strong kind of, uh, you know, strengthen their surrounding neighbors, similar to how you and I were talking about, you know, how much of the world relies on U.S. staying strong. And if U.S. gets weak, the rest of the world is affected by it because they can stand up against many of the bullies. That's what they were doing in Iran. Now, a couple of the mistakes that the Shah did make is in an interview he did, I believe it was BBC or Wallace, he talked about the fact that the blue-eyed people are taking one too many sleeping pills. And he said, within the next five years, you know, Iran's going to be the same as uh, Britain is. And he had a smirk on his face when he said that. You can see this when you watch the interview. And he was becoming a little bit too confident. Here's a man that's good looking, speaks seven different languages, diplomatic. He did what he did to Iran. Everybody around the world wants his oil. It's becoming a little too powerful. And it's not like it's a voting every four to eight years. You know, he's been in power for a while. It's a bit of a scary character that they have. So some people sat around and said, if this guy gets a little too powerful, we can't be pushing our weight anymore. We got to get rid of him. So maybe some of it was self-inflicted, but in many ways, Iran was a much better place when he was running Iran.